Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third annual and first in person uh, Indian Law and History Lecture hosted here at our brand new building at the University of Maine School of Law. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Anthony Maffa. I'm the faculty representative on the steering committee for this important event. I would like us to begin by acknowledging that the lands and waters that we now call Maine are the ancestral homelands of the Abenaki and Wabanaki people and continue to be home to the sovereign people of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq peoples. In particular, campus lands sit, at the, sit on the ancestral fishing, hunting, and agricultural grounds inhabited by the people of these Wabanaki tribal nations for thousands of years. Today's program will consist of two parts. First, we will hear from Jenner and Block attorney Lenny Powell, who in a relatively short time has built an impressive resume of Indian law victories, including last year's Supreme Court decision in Holland versus Brockeen, upholding the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. He is also a former elected leader of his federally recognized tribe, the Hopland Band of Pomo Indians. Following a question and answer session with Lenny, we will transition to the second part of the program, which will be, uh, for which Lenny will be joined by a panel of main experts, attorney Ryan Luller, uh, Wabanaki Reach board member Esther Ann, Chief Judge Eric Maynard of the Penobscot Nation Tribal Court, uh, to discuss Indian child adoption in our state here in Maine. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn uh, the microphone and the program over, over to Lenny. Thank you, Professor Moffa. It is uh, great to be here. It's my first time in Maine, uh, but it is as beautiful as they say. Um, and I'm very glad to be here to talk about the Indian Child Welfare Act, also known as ICWA, and this term's major victory for Native American tribes in Holland v. Brackeen, and of course about Indian law and history more broadly. Now, um, as Professor Moffa noted, I was one of the attorneys who litigated Brackeen on behalf of the tribal parties uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court, along with uh, my colleagues uh, Ian Gershengorn, who argued the case before the court, and Keith Harper. And this may be a bit of an unconventional lecture uh, for this forum. I am a practicing attorney, not a scholar, and certainly not an historian. Um, that said, Indian law is a subject that turns as much on history uh, as it does on logic. Uh, so it is impossible to practice Indian law without uh, becoming at least an amateur historian in this area. Um, I also often, when I talk about Brackeen, am talking to an audience that has a substantial amount of background knowledge about Indian law. Already, I know some of you may have limited exposure to this subject before now, which is fine. I hope have, I've accommodated, um, but I'll hope you'll forgive me if my talk is a bit less theoretical than a typical lecture in this form. Um, and if I've glossed over concepts that are new to you, please feel free to ask questions at the end. Don't feel embarrassed. I've been steeped in these subjects for about 15 years now, but I know for most people, this is brand new material. Um, there are no dumb questions here. Um, so I plan to cover uh, four things. First, I'll talk a bit about what ICWA is and why it was enacted. Then I'll explain how the Brackeen case arose and discuss the arguments that the challengers raised. Uh, I'll go, after that, I'll go through the court's holdings, and finally, I'll briefly give you my take on the broader significance of the ruling, which I'm sure uh, will be something um, that is also uh, of interest during the Q&A. So to set the table, passed in 1968, ICWA was the culmination of and response to the federal government's practices and policies with respect to Indian children over the course of two centuries. From the very start of the Republic, Indian children were central to the United States' relationship with Indian tribes. For instance, the first treaty that the United States ratified committed the United States to ensure the security of the children of the Delaware, and in the ensuing decades to achieve so-called civilization of Native Americans, the United, the United States extensively funded Indian care. Indeed, 110 Indian treaties provided for Indian education, uh, 
and some treaties contain provisions specifically addressing the care and guardianship of Indian orphans. When federal policy turned toward assimilation after the Civil War, the United States became especially focused on Indian children. In one of the darkest periods of our country's history, the federal government forcibly removed Indian children to boarding schools with the philosophy, kill the Indian, save the man. That broader policy goal continued into the, quote, termination era of the 1950s. Though the federal government's preferred means of achieving that end evolved during this period, uh, uh, though, though, sorry, at this point, the federal government's preferred means of achieving that end did evolve. During this period, the federal government endeavored to terminate its supervisory responsibilities for Indian tribes. To do so, among other things, the federal government closed most boarding schools, instead seeking to transfer responsibility for Indian children to states. States initially tried to disclaim authority for Indian children. They maintained such children were the federal government's responsibility. Eventually, though, states did accept the federal government's invitation, and the consequences for Indian tribes and families were devastating. States designed their laws to facilitate the removal of Indian children to non-Indian homes. They did so because placing Indian children with wealthy non-Indian families saved states money. Moreover, states sought to satisfy escalating non-Indian demand for Indian adoptees. The result was a wholesale removal of Indian children that by 1970 was described as, quote, the most tragic aspect of Indian life. The 1970s, however, proved to be a period of change. Federal policy finally supported tribal self-determination, and one of the major efforts Congress initiated during this era was convening hearings to investigate the crisis of the removal of Indian children via state court proceedings. Congress's hearings detailed the impact on the tribes themselves of the massive removal of their children. Congress found that, that uh, to quote the congressional uh, record, abusive child welfare practices resulted in upwards of one third of Indian children being separated from their families. In addition, Congress determined that the state actors who removed Indian children often had no basis for intelligently evaluating the cultural and social premises underlying Indian home life. Indeed, many of the state actors were, as the Supreme Court would put it in, uh, the, in a decision called Holyfield from, um, uh, that came out uh, around 15 years after it was enacted, um, Many of the state actors were, quote, at best ignorant of Indian cultural values and at worst contemptful of the Indian way. Such actors were convinced that removal, usually to non-Indian households or institutions, would unequivocally benefit Indian children. The result of these practices, Congress included, was wholly inappropriate decisions finding neglect or abandonment where none existed. And the impact on Indian tribes, families, and children was devastating. Due to the operation of state law and state courts, more than a quarter of Indian children were torn from their families and tribes, and approximately 90% of placements were non-Indian homes. In response to these shocking findings, in 1978, Congress, with overwhelming bipartisan support, enacted ICWA to address this crisis. Well, I'm having some trouble getting the slides to go, but ICWA is based on a simple idea. When Indian children can stay with their families and communities, tribes and children alike are better off. Indeed, today, ICWA has become the gold standard for child welfare. At least that's what many organizations that are focused on child welfare say. And it has staunched the flood of unwarranted removals of Indian children from their homes. There are still many problems, but ICWA has done tremendous good. And one of the ways ICWA has done this is by establishing minimum procedural and substantive rights that apply in state court child custody proceedings involving Indian children. Procedurally, ICWA requires notice when an Indian child is subject to an involuntary proceeding seeking foster care placement or termination of parental rights. In such involuntary cases, the parties initiating the case must provide notice to parents, custodians, and to tribes which have intervention rights. On substance, ICWA combats the ignorance and contempt that spurred its enactment. For instance, ICWA contains an active efforts provision, which requires any party seeking foster care placement or termination of parental rights to satisfy the court that active efforts have been made to prevent foster care placement or termination. In addition, ICWA sets preferences that apply when involuntary placement becomes necessary. Most notably, it provides adoptive placement preferences to one, a member of the child's extended family, two, other members of the Indian child's tribe, or three, other Indian families. 
State courts, however, may depart from these preferences for good cause. So with all that in mind, we can turn to, okay, it is working. We can turn to the Brackeen case itself. Now, Brackeen had a lengthy history. Uh, it started in 2017, long before, for instance, people ever heard of uh, something called COVID-19. The basics are the Brackeen couple and other individuals who said they wanted to adopt Indian children filed in the Northern District of Texas, a federal suit against federal officials seeking to have ICWA declared facially unconstitutional. Texas, Louisiana, and Indiana joined the challenge though of those states. Only Texas would ultimately press the challenge before the US Supreme Court. The United States and five tribes who intervened defended ICWA's constitutionality. In the lower courts, the Fifth Circuit went on bonk and largely upheld ICWA, but the decision was fractured. There were 325 pages of opinions. There was no single majority opinion. And on some issues, the en banc court split 8-8. <clears throat> the Supreme Court granted cert. Now, I like to say the case presented five sets of issues. Um, you could say it presented 105 issues, depending on, depending on how uh, finally you wanted uh, to parse it. It is uh, an exceptionally complicated case, um, even for the US Supreme Court. But today, for today's purposes, we'll, we'll define the issues as follows. First, whether Congress possessed authority to pass ICWA under Article I. Second, whether the parties had standing to challenge ICWA on equal protection and non-delegation grounds. Third, whether ICWA comports with the equal protection component of the Fifth Amendment's due process clause. Fourth, whether ICWA violates 10th Amendment anti-commandeering principles. And fifth, whether a provision of ICWA that allows tribes to reorder ICWA's placement preferences violates the non-delegation doctrine. Now, since our topic today is Indian law and history, I'll focus primarily on the Article I and equal protection issues. Those were the challenger's broadest arguments, and they attempted to rewrite the very fundamentals of federal Indian law in ways that would have completely upended settled understandings going back to the founding. Starting with Article I, the challengers here picked up an argument that Justice Thomas had articulated previously and concurring opinions from the last 20 or so years. Um, the first was a case called United States v. Laura. The second was the last ICWA case before this one that the court had heard, Adopt a Couple versus Baby Girl. Now, by way of background, the Supreme Court has long held that Congress possesses plenary power, i.e. complete and total power, over Indian affairs. But the challengers, they maintained essentially the opposite. Now, their argument went basically as follows. They maintain that Congress does not have complete power over Indian affairs because the federal government is a government of enumerated powers and because there is no so-called plenary power provision in the Constitution. The challengers focused in particular on the Indian Commerce Clause. They maintain that that clause is the primary source of Congress's power with respect to Indian tribes. And they argue that the Indian Commerce Clause extends only as far as the Interstate Commerce Clause in terms of the powers it confers on Congress. And no one disputes that the Interstate Commerce Clause uh, is not a grant of plenary authority to the United States over um, uh, the sorts of the areas where Congress has been able to legislate with respect to Indian affairs. Now, the challengers also acknowledge that there is a treaty clause in the Constitution that has been cited as at least one other source for federal authority over Indian affairs. Um, but they maintain that the treaty clause had no application here because ICWA applies to all tribes, yet not all tribes have treaties. As a fallback, the challengers also argued that, at minimum, family law is an area of exclusive state authority. The challengers' broadest arguments here were radical. If they had succeeded, it would have affected a monumental transfer of power over Indian affairs from the federal government to the states. On equal protection, the challengers advanced similarly broad theories. The Supreme Court has again long held most notably in a case from the 1970s called Morton v. Mankari, that tribal classifications are political classifications and thus, thus subject only to rational basis review. And I don't know how many non-lawyers we have in the audience, so I'll pause and say, um, when you have an equal protection challenge, most of the fight is over the legal framework you use to, to conduct your analysis. There are these things called tiers of scrutiny. Um, 
racial challenges are evaluated under something called strict scrutiny. If strict scrutiny applies, the law will almost certainly fail. Uh, if uh, a more deferential standard of review applies, the rational basis framework applies, then um, the law will almost certainly be upheld. All you have to show is that Congress sort of had a rational basis for adopting the law and chose reasonable means for trying to accomplish its end. Um, this distinction matters immensely because if you were to analyze Indian law statutes using that strict scrutiny framework, a uh, huge number of federal Indian law statutes would fall if they are instead organized, uh, analyzed under the rational basis theory, uh, sorry, framework, then they almost always survive review. And Mankari said, yes, the rational basis framework is what applies. The challengers, however, sought to upend that framework in this case. They did not technically ask the Supreme Court to overrule any of its precedents in this area, but they argued that tribal classifications are nevertheless actually race-based and presumptively unconstitutional. The challengers also attempted to create new artificial limits on Mankari's scope, arguing, for instance, that this rational basis framework can only apply when a law is geographically limited to honor near Indian lands or when it implicates uh, self tribal self-government in some way. Um, on the race-based front, their theory was tribes frequently use ancestry as a determination uh, as to who their own members will be. And so they say federal laws that target tribes, even if they're focused on tribal membership, are using ancestry and thus are really using tribal membership as a proxy for race. These race-based arguments, however, flew in the face of well-established equal protection principles. The very text of the Constitution singles out Indians for special treatment. Most notably, the Commerce Clause expressly states that the Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. And tribal classifications, in fact, turn on political relationships not racial ones. They turn on the political relationship between a tribal, between, excuse me, between a tribal citizen and the citizen's tribe. And they turn on the political relationship between the tribe itself and the federal government. Moreover, their premise is wrong, though it is certainly true that ancestry uh, can be used to determine by a tribe to determine membership. Uh, tribal citizenship does not clearly correlate with race. Many people are racially Native American, but not eligible for citizenship in any tribe. And some people are not racially Indian, but nevertheless are tribal citizens. A prominent example here is the Cherokee freedmen, the descendants of uh, slaves that had been held by the Cherokee Nation before the Civil War. Today, they can be citizens of the Cherokee Nation. So for those reasons, the challengers brought us attacks were wrong. And the challengers' artificial limits on Mankari were likewise baseless. Congress has, from the beginning, legislated with respect to tribes and their members wherever they may be, may be found. And as to tribal self-government, ICWA, by keeping Indian children within their homes, does advance tribal sovereignty. It protects the integrity of Indian tribes and families. So what happened? Well, the court, by a vote of 7 to 2, roundly rejected the challenge to ICWA's constitutionality. Justice Barrett wrote the opinion for the court. She was joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Jackson. On Article I, the majority determined that Congress possessed the authority to enact ICWA. It recognized that in a long line of cases, the court has characterized Congress's power to legislate with respect to Indians as plenary and exclusive. And the majority traced this authority to a number of possible constitutional sources, including the Indian Commerce Clause, the Treaty Clause, the Constitution's structure, the Constitution's adoption of pre-constitutional powers necessarily inherent in any federal government, and the trust relationship between the United States and the Indian people. The majority observed that the court has not doubted Congress's ability, sorry, yes, Congress's ability to legislate across a wide range of areas. Uh, when in the field of Indian affairs, including criminal law, domestic violence, employment, property, tax, and trade. And the court emphasized that there is no sort of firewall around family law in particular that prevents Congress from exercising its powers in that particular area. 
True, the court did characterize its precedence in this area as unwieldy, and it stressed that Congress's powers here have limits, but the court emphasized that two centuries in, the slate is not clean, and the court concluded that the challengers failed to offer a coherent theory for why Congress could enact all those other federal Indian law statutes, but not ICWA. The court thus upheld the Fifth Circuit's conclusion that ICWA is consistent with Article I. The court then turned to the anti-commandeering arguments. I'll not dwell here. This is not really an Indian law issue, though Indian law practitioners have become a lot more familiar with anti-commandeering doctrine because of this case. Anti-commandeering is a principle that says um, the federal government cannot force a state to take action. The court stressed two main problems with the challenger's anti-commandeering theories. First, a law comports with the 10th Amendment when it applies even-handedly to both states and other actors. And in the case of ICWA, most of its commands apply not just to states, but to any party who initiates an involuntary child welfare proceeding, which sweeps in private individuals private adoption and private adoption agencies, in addition to state officials. Second, there is one part of ICWA that applies uh, just to um, uh, states, specifically the state courts, some record keeping requirements, but there's actually historical analogs from around the time of the founding, so those are okay. Well, finally, the court turned to standing and found that the challengers lacked the ability to pursue their facial federal claims. Standing doctrine essentially is that you need to show that you have been injured by the law that you're challenging and that the people you're trying to sue uh, are the ones who are actually responsible for that injury. Now here, ICWA is implemented by state officials, not federal ones, and the challengers had not sued state officials. So that was a serious standing problem. And as to Texas in particular, well, Texas in trying to mount the equal protection theory was trying to assert the rights of its citizens, not the um, rights of itself. States don't have equal protection rights, um, but the citizens of Texas are also citizens of the United States and the United States shares the interest in vindicating whatever interests they have. So states are not able to sort of assert those citizens' rights against the federal government um, when, again, the interests that Texas and the United States have are the same. So for that reason, the court did not reach on the merits the equal protection and non-delegation challenges, um, though it did reject them both, again, for lack of standing. Now, there were four separate opinions. Justice Gorsuch, joined in part by Justices Sotomayor and Jackson, concurred to elaborate further on the sources of Congress's authority over Indian affairs and the tragic history that necessitated ICWA's enactment. Justice Kavanaugh, writing solely for himself, expressed the view that the equal protection issue is serious under the court's existing precedents. He suggested that the court should take up the equal protection question in a future case where a challenger has standing, such as a case arising out of a state court foster care or adoption proceeding. Justice Thomas penned a solo dissent. He largely reiterated the points he made in his previous separate opinions on this subject. He stressed that he views Congress's powers over, in, over Indian affairs as limited. And finally, Justice Alito also wrote a solo dissent. He believed the challengers were correct that family law falls outside of Congress's otherwise plenary power over Indian affairs. So what does this case, I know we're focused on history, but what does this case mean for the future? Well, to be frank, in some ways, there is not much to analyze in this decision. Um, there's, I think, around 110 or 120 pages of opinions. The majority is maybe 40 or 50 pages. Uh, but if you've already read the seminal cases in this area of the law that talk about the sources of Congress's power uh, in Indian affairs, you'll be hard-pressed to learn anything new about Indian, Indian law when reading Brackeen. Indeed, when future generations of law students read the decision, I won't be surprised if this 7-2 to outcome comes across as routine, mundane, or even obvious in the case. But while I'm a biased commentator, I think Brackeen is one of the most critical Indian law decisions uh, that we will see within our lifetimes. The case was profoundly important for two reasons. First, ICWA itself is one of the most critical Indian law statutes that Congress has ever passed. Second, the scope of this case was extremely broad. The challengers essentially litigated the constitutionality of federal Indian law itself. Now, to be sure, precedent was unequivocally on our side going in. But many were unsure whether the court would stick to its past cases. 
there had been almost complete turnover on the court since it last engaged directly with any of these fundamental questions. And after the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs overturning Roe v. Wade, I think everyone watching the court last term wondered whether and when the court was going to reconsider old decisions. The challengers certainly seem to have thought everything was on the table. At least that's the only reasonable inference I'm able to draw from the sweeping arguments they presented. And in confidence, many of the law professor told me before the decision was issued that they had no idea how they were going to teach the subject this year. They were worried Brackeen would render existing Indian law casebooks obsolete. But in fact, we got just the opposite. Now that Brackeen has been decided, I think it is clear Indian law is not an area where this court is looking to overturn its precedents. To be sure, Justice Kavanaugh writes a concurrence suggesting that ICWA poses an equal protection problem, but no other justice joins that opinion. Moreover, Justice Kavanaugh did not invite a full rethinking of the Mancard framework. Rather, he suggests ICWA might violate equal protection under the court's precedents. Justice Kavanaugh about three weeks ago, issued another uh, separate statement in an Indian law case about an equal protection issue um, where the court denied a request for a stay. Again, no one else joined Justice Kavanaugh um, when he issued that opinion. So at a high level, I think that the court has more or less shut the door on arguments that attack the constitutionality of all of federal Indian law and policy. There will, I'm sure, continue to be questions about whether a particular piece of future, le future legislation or a particular application of an existing law falls within Congress's power and comports with equal protection. But compared to what was at stake in Brackeen, such questions will be on the margins. Um, the constitutionality of the core of federal Indian law and policy, I believe and hope, is now settled for a long time to come. Now time for an addendum of sorts. When I talk about Brackeen, this is often where I leave things and I know that we wanna leave time uh, for our great panel as well. But given that this is specifically an Indian law and history lecture, and because the court did not end up turning to the merits of the equal protection question, I feel it is appropriate to add here just a couple more brief remarks about equal protection and Indian law. If there's one thing I'd want you to take away from today's lecture, it would be that equal protection challenges to statutes targeting tribes are ahistorical. At the time of its enactment, there were not serious concerns the 14th Amendment had altered the federal government's ability to regulate Indian affairs. There was one Senate report on this subject. It was issued shortly after the 14th Amendment's enactment, and it stated unequivocally that the Equal Protection Clause had, quote, no effect whatever upon the status of the Indian tribes and did not, quote, repudiate the United States national obligations. Indeed, radical Republican leader Thaddeus Stevens, one of the four most proponents of the 14th Amendment, emphasized the importance of fulfilling the federal promise of protection to Indians. And as Professor, Professor Bethany Berger has observed, the 14th, 14th Amendment challenges to tribal treaties and legislation immediately after the 14th Amendment's enactment went nowhere. Indeed, it would have been quite odd, I think, to the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment um, which by its terms applied only to the states uh, if, the, if that amendment had altered the federal government's authority and responsibilities in this area of paramount federal power. And then the uh, ensuing decades after ratification, federal assertions of authority in Indian country only grew. In fact, the federal insertion into the lives of Indians grew to the highest point it had ever been and ever would be. It is, for instance, the era of boarding schools. No one thought there was any problem with the federal rent going into Indian homes, ripping children away, and taking them hundreds of miles away to these institutions that tried to strip away their culture. So the notion that now, suddenly, equal protection has arisen to uh, stop modest efforts by Congress to keep Indians in their homes is a bit hard to reconcile with that past. And unsurprisingly, if you go through the federal reporters from the 20th century, you'll be hard pressed, at least until mid-century, to find decisions addressing Indian law equal protection questions. People just didn't raise them. It wasn't something people really thought was thought would need a discussion. 
It's only in the 1960s to 1970s that the suggestion that there are serious equal protection problems in Indian law started to get floated with any regularity or seriousness. And given that the Supreme Court has made clear that constitutional interpretation to the extent possible is an inquiry into original meaning, I suggest that this history, this absence of concern until relatively recently um, is all one needs to know to disregard these meritless equal protection challenges. Thank you, and I look forward to questions. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, just before we turn to the panel, I'd, I'd like to open it up for some questions just for you based on, on those remarks. So does anyone in the room um, or on Zoom have a question for Lenny? I'll bring the mic to you. Don't be shy. You want me to take the first question? <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, are we okay? Yeah, I was gonna stop the screen share. <laughs> so I'm a little bit interested in, 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 in your read of the personalities on the court, um, and Justice Gorsuch in particular, um, whose Indian law jurisprudence seems to depart in some ways from his jurisprudence on other matters. And I wonder, um, as from the perspective of a litigator who's bringing cases before the court, how you approach uh, briefing the cases, arguing the cases to the justices and, and making those appeals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if I'm writing an amicus brief, uh, I might think, oh, maybe this is something that'll give Justice Gorsuch some stuff to cite in a, in a separate opinion, or hopefully if he writes the majority opinion, if he writes the majority opinion, the tribes have very likely won. Um, you know, it, with, with that type of more narrowly targeted brief, I might have a specific justice in mind, especially Gorsuch in an Indian law case. But when working on um, uh, when representing a, a party to a case and submitting the party's brief to the court, um, uh, you know, it's it's hard to predict how they're going to come down. I mean, yeah, we we strongly suspected we had Gorsuch in this case after his dissent in in Castro Huerta. Um, we all but knew we had his vote on the plenary power question, um, vice versa. We all but knew we didn't have Justice Thomas's um, vote in this case um, because of the position he had articulated in decisions like Laura and adoptive couple, that we did include a citation or two to previous opinions where he confessed error and we tried to be like, hey, Justice Thomas, some of that scholarship you relied on, it's been called into question. Could you have an open mind about this? you know, he's, he still thinks we're wrong, but, um, you know, the polar extremes close to set in their views, it's the middle that you're aiming after, which in Indian law cases these days, you know, this is a very young court still, there's a lot to learn about it, um, but Roberts and Barrett so far seem to be those swing votes, and they just have not They've not, in my view, especially Barrett, because she's so new, but they've not, in my view, articulated really clear theoretical visions of federal Indian law. It seems to be more of a subject that they'll think about it when there's a case that forces them to think about it, but it's not, they go home at night, they're not thinking about uh, this area with whatever extra time they have to think big thoughts. Um, and so... All you, all you can really do is, is just use, just present the arguments that more broadly sounded the themes that this court seems to care about. Um, you know, history is uh, increasingly important. Um, we see that, for instance, in the Second Amendment context. Um, and and, and in general, I think this is always true in Supreme Court practice, but especially after Dobbs, making sure to start with first principles and, and not assume they're going to take precedent for granted. But beyond that, I don't know that it actually differs that much from briefing in any court. You always just make judgments about what seems persuasive and presented. Thanks. 
the room. That spur any thoughts? Yep. Yeah. Do you mind saying who you are? Sure. Uh, Joe Savisky, attorney here in Portland. Uh, thanks for your remarks. Uh, Follow-up question to something you you just mentioned in your previous answer um, about Roberts and um, who's the other justice? The swing boats. Uh, Barrett. Yeah, Barrett. Um, they'll think about these issues when uh, a bigger case forces them to think about it. Can you uh, imagine what that hypothetical case might be? Uh, there, if there's a um, you know a, a different set of, of factual circumstances that might cause the court to look into these issues more deeply? Yeah, so I think that there are two things in your question. One is, just to clarify my, my previous remark, I, I think that in his, his spare time, someone like Chief Justice Roberts is probably thinking about the balance of federalism and um, you know what is the scope of executive privilege, but he's not thinking about Indian law until he has a case and he's like, oh, I actually have to cast a vote and or write an opinion in this one. Um, then he does think about it, but, and I, you know, I don't know the man, I can't say for sure what he spends his time doing, but just, it just, I get the impression that until he has a case um, in front of him, he's not thinking about it. And then he's only thinking about what he needs to think about to decide the precise questions at issue. Um, so I would say like Brackeen is an instance where he did turn to it and did think about it, though ultimately he decided as really all the justices did, other than Kavanaugh, nobody said anything really about equal protection and even Kavanaugh recognized there was no standing. Um, uh, so, so in that sense, I would say every Indian law case does get all the justices thinking about these issues. They're, they're very hardworking and engaged uh, individuals across the board, even if um, you you know they have wide partisan differences, and I think every one of us probably has at least one justice where we're like that one always gets it wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, I think the other part of your question gets sort of to Kavanaugh's point about um, should the court take these things up in a future case, and what's that case look like? Um, I think that at the Supreme Court, appetite matters a lot. The Supreme Court has close to a purely discretionary docket. 99 plus percent of its cases, it has them up there because it decided to take them up there. Could have just left in place the lower court ruling. Uh, day after day, really anytime you're litigating an Indian law question, whoever is opposed to the law that is doing something that benefits tribes or Indians in some way could throw in an equal protection challenge. It's, it's not hard to get a case where there is standing. In terms of ICWA in particular, um, this was a really bizarre posture. You don't challenge statutes in this way. Uh, state court proceedings day after day are deciding child placement matters and people have been raising equal protection challenges in those cases since around the time of it was enactment. Really, even the the congressional record is has a pretty thorough discussion of whether ICWA comported with equal protection. Um, and in the first five years, we saw like half a dozen or so equal protection challenges to ICWA. And then they went away for sort of a decade and they picked it back in the 90s and they've never gone away since. There are a few groups who have been particularly focused on trying to strike down equal uh, on equal protection grounds, and they have been sort of fostering and supporting these efforts. They've filed, like if you go on a legal database and you look through the cert petitions and you type in equal, you'll see probably dozens of petitions from the last 20 years. In cases where there's plainly standing, they tried to raise these issues. The, the problem for them is that their equal protection theory it's not very compelling. Uh, the only way they start to get people on board with them is when they imagine a hypothetical where, uh, like, their 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 core hypothetical is an Indian child in Maine. Sorry, in Na it's funny we're in Maine. I've never been in Maine when when talking about this, but it's always an Indian <laughs> child in Arizona gets adopted by an Indian family in Maine. 
and the Indian family in Maine has no connections to the tribe. It's not, of course, not related to the child, etc. And that family gets picked over uh, a local non-Indian family that, although although lacking Native American ancestry, is deeply tied to the community and knows the child's family and is basically like, you know, an aunt and uncle to the child already, et cetera, et cetera. Like they imagine this insane hypothetical that doesn't match any ICWA case that I'm aware of at all. Over the last 50 years, we've consulted with ICWA experts. We've looked <laughs> in legal databases. Um, and the other side has had every incentive in the world to try to find an actual case with that sort of fact pattern. They haven't found one either. The way ICWA gets applied in practice is typically like keeping the family within, sorry, keeping the Indian child within its own family or maybe with another member of the tribe. The, that last preference for other Indian families rarely gets invoked. Even when it does, it's most commonly invoked, say, in my tribe's region, uh, Northern California. There's a lot of, well, I'm, I'm Pomo. There's a, like over 20 different Pomo bands. Each one of us will have between 50 and 900 members, closer usually to 200. And so, you know, when, when a Pomo child comes up, it may be the case that it's like, well, this tribe of 50 doesn't have a placement, but this other Pomo tribe that's five miles down the road does. So like, that's when the other Indian family placement um, makes sense. That's when it's really getting used. And because the Supreme Court has a discretionary docket, the, the Supreme Court keeps seeing those types of fact patterns that don't present compelling equal protection challenges. That They tried this gambit, this this unmoored facial challenge in federal court against federal officials, because I think it was the only way they could try to present a case that seemed compelling on the merits that presented this abstract fake hypothetical that, yeah, if that, if you ever get that case and it goes up to the Supreme Court, I would be surprised if they find equal as applied in those circumstances violates equal protection. But that's so different from saying that the whole statute needs to fall. I mean, the, the rule for facial challenges is more or less, <laughs> it really is supposed to be invalid in all of its applications. ICWA is certainly not. I mean, the family member preference, that's not even racial at all because Native Americans frequently have non-Native American um, family members. I certainly do. Um, and they qualify, those non-Native family members qualify for that first placement preference under ICWA to the exact same degree as the Native American family members do. So that's a long way of saying, I'm hopeful that the court is gonna continue to see fact patterns, come actual fact patterns in the real world coming out of state courts where people are trying to get these equal protection questions up and the court is like, well, that, that seems more or less fine. And, this is not, you know, we take 60, 65 cases a year. This is not going to be one of them. I, was, I we should probably get to the yeah. panel. Thank you, Lenny. So I, I'd like to invite our panelists up to join Lenny here, uh, Judge Maynard, Esther, Ann, and Ryan Lawler, um, if you'd come up and, and join me at, at this table. And and I think this is a good time as we're doing this transition to thank um, our, our wonderful sponsors of this event, Bernstein Schur, Drummond Woodsum. Maine Conservation Voters and League of Conservation Voters. Without them, you wouldn't have the wonderful lunch that's outside uh, here today. And so join me in, in thanking all of them for sponsoring. And also thanks to, to many of you who, who made donations online for the registration form. It re really means a lot to keep this lecture going. As I said, this is the third annual and we hope to keep, continue doing this every year um, and making it bigger and bigger each year. So. The, the more support you give, the, the more possible that is. So um, I'm going to turn to to our panelists here and just talk with them a little bit about uh, how this works here in the state of Maine. So I wonder if, if we might start um, with Judge Maynard, who uh, has presided over, I'm sure, many cases where this, uh, where ICWA is implicated, and just ask um, what uh, you've seen uh, before Bracken and post Bracken. Has there been uh, any changes to how this the statute is being invoked? Have have you seen it um, utilized more frequently, for instance, or is you know uh, what are you seeing out there? Thank you. Uh, thank you, University of 
um, the law school for having me here and, and thank the sponsors for, for all they've done. Um, when, you, when we talk about ICWA, um, it's important to know that, that the Penobscot Nation is a Title IV direct tribe, meaning that they operate with the same degree of sovereignty uh, as the state does. They are direct with the federal government to the tribe. And so when an ICWA case comes up, the tribe is called in and to intervene. One of the challenges has been with that in the past, and it's gotten significantly better over the last couple of years. But one of the challenges has been with that in the past is the issue of the way that social workers would identify Native children. And the way that they would do that is wait for someone to self-report. And they would not ask. They'd simply say, well, they didn't tell us, therefore, we didn't notify the tribe. That was uh, a challenge for a period of time. The second thing that was a challenge as well from that was the issue of uh, calling in to confirm which tribe it might be. Um, again, the, the state has gotten incredibly better on doing that. I know that they're, they're making those phone calls. When I first started practicing, and now we're talking history, um, uh, with uh, as a, the chief judge, when I was the first appointed as a chief judge, um, the we had an ICWA case that arose in Southern Maine, and in it, the judge, the presiding judge, had determined that they were going to transfer the case to the Penobscot Nation, and the order said. Uh, we're going to transfer this case up to the Penobscot Nation, but uh, I, as a presiding judge down here in the state court system, retain ultimate authority to make the final decisions in the case. Um, and actually, it was Justice Softly who stepped in. We had a conversation, and she directed me to the, the uh, chief judge of the district court, who quickly stepped in, um, and the, that order was rescinded and a proper transfer order was drafted. Um, since that time, the relationship between the judiciary, the tribal court judiciary, and the state court judiciary has been uh, fantastic. We have conducted two joint hearings on ICWA matters when we're talking about how are we going to effectuate the transfer to ensure that it is seamless, especially for the child. Uh, so that I've seen has, has been extraordinarily better. And the last thing I'll say that is an interesting issue that is arising, and I don't know, I actually don't know, I'd be interested in Lenny's opinion on this, is we had a case where a Navajo family had a child in Northern Maine and said, we want that child, we want that case to be resolved in the Penobscot Nation Tribal Court. We don't want to resolve in the state court. We want to transfer. We can't transfer to the Navajo Nation all the way. We'd like to have it in the Penobscot Nation. It got resolved before that case, that issue ever got to its final resolution. Lenny, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> I have not read ICWA's text with uh, an eye toward how can you construe the term tribal court. Um, I am aware that this is an emerging issue, at least in Oklahoma, where in the wake of McGirt, the Oklahoma Supreme Court, over the objection of both the Creek Nation and um, the state attorney general, um, held that uh, the Creek Nation cannot exercise uh, authority over children who live within the Creek Reservation, but who are um, members of other tribes. So um, that his decision has been heavily criticized by ICWA advocates. Um, and it's it's not exactly the same as, as your fact pattern. Um, that's talking about original jurisdiction instead of transfer jurisdiction. The two clauses aren't exactly the same, um, but it, it is something I think would probably factor into any dispute about that. Thank you. I, I wanna turn to Esther for a moment and talk a little bit about the um, social services side and, and what Wabanaki Reach is doing and how that, particularly with some of Judge Maynard's remarks about 
reporting and how we identify children who might um, be entitled to ICWA, ICWA relief. And I wonder what your thoughts on that are. Thank you. And Fliwi Zastaran, Wabanakik, Peskrumukari Nil, Nu Jeyu Zibayik, Nu Rebeg Zibayik, we go Banawabskewi. My name's Esther Ann. I'm Wabanaki, um, <clears throat> the people where the sun first looks our way. And I am Passamaquoddy, the people who spear Pollock. My family is from Zibayik, which literally, literally means on the edge. And I live um, <clears throat> the place of the White Rocks with Penobscot people. Um, and so I work for the Catherine Cutler Institute here at the university. I've been there for about 20 years. I'm a policy associate too. Um, I don't consider myself an ICWA expert. <laughs> um, I've been fortunate enough to work. Um, now I facilitate the tribal state ICWA work group, which was created back in 1999. Um, the state of Maine participated in a pilot review of their child welfare system, and they were found to be out of compliance with ICWA. So to their credit, they reached out to the tribal child welfare um, departments each of the there's five departments with, within four tribes and um, asked for help to develop a training for their caseworkers. And we got together in November of 99 um, and created a training for caseworkers. And then we stayed together and started working on better policy, better training. Um, we even developed a case review tool that we, we administered together. Um, and then we created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, uh, the first in the country to address uh, Indian child welfare. And <clears throat> so what was your question? <laughs> okay, so, so the TRC, when they released their report in 2015, they, they did find that the state, that one of the issues, as Judge Menard said, was children were not being identified in the system. Mm -hmm. So the ICWA work group has um, worked extensively to try to fix that. So we, we train caseworkers, the OCFS caseworkers, but we also uh, train outside agencies that interact with families and ask them to keep asking the question, ask about native uh, membership and citizenship often and um, all the time and ask different people, not just the parents, ask all the collateral contacts and so you can get the information. And um, <clears throat> on the ICWA work group, we have two of the people from the AG's office, Ariel and she, and they, um, when, I don't know if you all know that Maine passed an equal law in June, the end of June, and they were um, so instrumental in how they wrote that law to, to try to protect it from the stuff that's happening with the Supreme Court. And um, in the preamble of that law, they acknowledged uh, that the tribes are political entities and really train caseworkers not to talk in racial terms when they're when they're engaging and asking about identity. Um, I don't know what else you want to know. I mean, <laughs> that's great. I can talk. <laughs> I have one thing to yeah, sure. Um, for the people practicing in the family area, if you're out in practicing and you think that the that the tribe there might be a native involved in that call the the all the tribes have a census uh, you can call up and ask if someone's on the census um, you can call the penobscot nation tribal court Rhonda DeConte, the clerk there will answer the question uh, but call uh, because i think it's an extra added resource if someone's not asking <laughs> thanks and and with that uh, with an eye towards practice I'd, I'd like to ask brian a question just um, as someone who practices in this area, um, yeah, what does representation look like in a, in a typical case? And, and how are you coordinating with the uh, state of Maine attorney general's office? Who, who all is involved from an attorney perspective? And what are the issues you're seeing as someone who's a practitioner? Yeah, and I think I'll turn this a little bit interactive here. So first question is just to be safe. Do we have any AGs in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so uh, does anybody practice in this area of law? Does anybody take appointments or otherwise? I mean, other than uh, in the attorney general's office. So I think it'd be good to just start with what the process is. Um, Can everybody hear me if I don't use this actually? Or I think you probably want to use it for the Zoom. For the Zoom folks, okay. Um, 
So the process generally starts um, with a protection order being a petition for protection being placed by uh, the state of Maine. Um, there is a very parallel process that happens in the tribal courts as well uh, with the respective agencies that the tribes have that are similar to um, or the exact same as depending on construction uh, DHHS. Uh, so a petition for protection is placed. That's sort of the first step. And generally that petition alleges certain facts um, about a reason that the child might be at a risk of harm or may have been harmed, um, all of those things. Sometimes that's accompanied by what's called a preliminary protection order or a PPO. That's an emergency uh, thing that's filed out in addition to the petition for protection. Um, and that basically allows for the state um, or if we're on the tribal side for the tribe, to basically remove the child much sooner. Um, and it sets up a very quick hearing um, on that PPO. Um, and so that's sort of the PPO process. On the other side, no matter which way we go, we end up just like when you file pretty much anything in the state of Maine, you're gonna get a status conference or a case management conference within the first few weeks or first month. Um, at that conference, you're pretty much going to just be getting the court introduced to all the parties, the child, what's going on, um, and you're going to be setting up the status of the rest of the case as it progresses, getting ready for what's going to be your jeopardy hearing. And your jeopardy hearing is where, um, unless the conditions have been alleviated somewhere in there, um, the state is going to be trying to present a case essentially that the child is at a continuing uh, risk of harm, has been harmed, um, all of those things. And of course, if you're a parent's attorney, um, you're either working with the um, AAG or the tribal child welfare attorney on trying to figure out if it makes sense to come to an agreement um, so that there are less harmful findings on, on the record for your client, or if you have a good case so that your client doesn't end up with Jeopardy. Um, and of course, the state is trying to, to get Jeopardy in place. If Jeopardy is put in place, um, or if Jeopardy isn't, then it's dismissed. We're kind of done there. Um, if Jeopardy is put into place, then what happens next um, is a very, very long process that seems to drag on forever until the resolution of the case. Um, the general rule is that case review is supposed to take place um, every six months thereafter until there's a resolution in the case. Um, generally, a reunification, not generally, a reunification plan has to be made. Um, and this is where we start to get into who are the different parties around the table. So throughout the uh, beginning of the case, you're gonna have your DHHS caseworker, your assistant attorney general, you're gonna have parents' attorneys, Often, especially if the placement is with um, family members, those family members show up. Sometimes they have, um, the statute lays out different rights depending upon what level of person you are. There's interested persons versus interveners. Um, some people have the right to uh, equal or equivalent rights to parties and can have attorneys, um, can cross-examine witnesses, et cetera. Um, and that's sort of the, the legal participants early in the case. As you get on in the case, um, you get the whole body of people who are involved in the reunification process. I find often for um, a lot of the cases that I've worked on, a lot of times, one of the things that's causing uh, the state or the tribe to believe that there's an issue of jeopardy is, is generally substance abuse. Um, and so when we're dealing with reunification, uh, often the people that we're seeing in the room are the, um, there will be, if someone's going to a sober house, it will be that sober house person uh, that works there and manages that house. Um, sometimes if there's been a criminal involvement, there's a probation officer that will show up. Um, we may also have other treatment and care providers that are showing up. Um, if the child has certain treatment or care providers for them, then that person may also show up. Um, and then also, I think one thing that's been really wonderful over the past few decades is a really large growing number of tribal nonprofits that have been focused on providing services to tribal members. So. Uh, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness is going to have a caseworker there. Almost every case, not almost every case I've worked on, they've, they've been there um, and they've been really great. Um, Wabanaki Women's Coalition, if there's some sort of domestic violence um, or family violence aspect, will also be there. Um, so it's a pretty broad slew of people that are at the table um, working through that reunification process. Um, and then I, there's some more stuff that can happen as you, as you go along, but I'll kind of weave that for I'd like to invite the, the crowd in the room uh, to ask questions, but also on Zoom, if you use the question and answer function, I'll get your questions. I have my laptop up here, um, but is anyone, I, I don't want to hog the questions here, so would you mind saying your name for the... Um, 
Colleen Tucker. I'm an attorney here in Portland working at, oh. Um, so can you explain uh, the history of the, the establishment of sovereignty for the tribal nations? And because I don't know how globally it works or it sounds like it's more sometimes regionally established. And I mean, I know that certain tribes are, you know, because I do real estate law working with tribal nations and, you know, a federally recognized, um, you know, Indian, but so is that a, their pockets or is it, I would have thought it was a, because we're dealing, you know, federal law is the primary, <clears throat> you know, dealer with them. And so I thought, of the Indian nations as a whole as being having their own sovereignty. Good, good question. It, that, this is very, that's like a fundamental question of federal Indian law. And I, I think it'd be good since Lenny is teaching this subject in the spring, not to put him on the spot, but I'd, <laughs> I'd love to hear uh, his sort of, I mean, you don't need to teach the whole subject in five minutes, but <laughs> I could do it. A I do it. Um, so first off, um, the, the balance of authority between um, the federal government, the tribe, and the state in an area where tribal authority exists um, often varies from state to state based on decisions Congress has made. Um, here in the Northeast in particular, it can get very state-specific, and I am not the person to ask about the specifics of how it works here in Maine. Um, but uh, you know, at a broad level, right, tribes are sovereigns that pre-exist contact with the Europeans. They govern themselves since time immemorial. You have European contact. Um, in the early days, relations are governed primarily by treaty. Um, of course, it's the British government. There's no American government yet. Um, the British government centralizes authority over Indian affairs in the crown and it tries to establish a policy of like, we've carved out our areas, you tribes have those areas, and we want peace because it's too expensive for the crown to fight wars with you all the time. Also, we're jostling with the French and the Spanish about what the territorial lines are between the European sovereigns within the Americas. And um, at that point in history, tribes were extremely powerful military players. So you also wanted tribes to come in on, you know, the crown wanted the tribes to come in on their side when they had wars like the French and Indian War um, uh, over these, these <coughs> European demarcations. The U.S. more or less adopts the same policy at the beginning. Um, you know, after the founding, after there's there's a little bit of experimentation under the Articles of Confederation, but under the U.S. Constitution, they pretty much land on the same policy that the um, the Crown had had. The uh, the colonies turned into states, though, were often sort of had different views on what should happen. They were much more focused on pushing westward, um, and and the wars would typically be drains on the US treasury, not on any individual state treasury. So you had sort of a incentive problem where you know a state like Georgia was eager to go after Cherokee lands, even though it was the US army that would bear the costs um, and the repercussions of that. In a series of seminal cases from around 1820 to 1832, the US Supreme Court established the basic sort of demarkers of the, the situation we have today. It recognized that tribes have inherent sovereignty, um, but it incorporated a really a Catholic um, doctrine from around the Columbus era, um, the doctrine of discovery, which pretty much said, oh, well, if you're not Christian, and it's not, it's not, quite, it's not quite as explicitly religious in the way the Supreme Court uh, ended up incorporating it, but basically, if you aren't Christian, which the Supreme Court more is like, if you weren't European, you couldn't have full, true title to the lands. Once the Europeans set foot on it, the ultimate power over the land went into the the monarch who whose explorers set foot, 
um, and the tribes had a right to use and possess the land, which only the, the overriding sovereign, the monarch, and later the United States could um, sort of take either by purchase or by um, conquest. And that's still sort of the theoretical boundaries of this today. Within areas that tribes have not ceded, um, they retain their inherent sovereignty and federal law otherwise provides the backdrop. But Congress has passed oodles of statutes that make this all way more complicated. And the Supreme Court has inferred a lot from congressional silence and eroded a lot of tribal sovereignty in, in doing so. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add to that? Sure. Maine is a Settlement Act state. And as a Settlement Act state, Congress, whether it had the authority to do so or not, delegated its authority to enter into a treaty uh, with the tribes here in Maine to the state of Maine. And so here, the, the relationship is different than what you might see out west, um, where the, they are more treaty, uh, federal government related mm -hmm. tribes. Although you do get some P PL 280 tribes out west as well. PL 280 are during the, was the termination era, right? They were saying, uh, we're just going to let the states control what happens with regards to the tribes. So um, there's a real, as Bonnie was saying, a real broad divergence. Here in Maine, the challenge has been that and Donald Loring is actually here with us and had a, uh, taken a lead in having a conversation. The state's policy was about isolation control and elimination of the tribes, starting from its, its early inception um, all the way through. You'll read things in the 1940s where they're talking about how can we get these tribes, how can we get rid of the tribes, see if we can limit them to a certain number of uh, blood quantum, and then when they don't have that blood quantum anymore, then they can't be tribal members. The state was making those decisions. Under federal law, only the tribes make those decisions. Yeah, that, that's right. Th thanks, Eric. Um, uh, so any other questions in the room? Hi, uh, Sean Mahoney with the Conservation Law Foundation. I'm, I'm curious about what your level of concern is, and I guess this is particularly to Lenny with respect to any sort of, um, with respect to whether Brackeen represents the beginning of another long-term campaign to undermine a federal law or a federal right, um, like we saw with the campaign against Roe. You know, you've got Gibson Dunn and lots of big support for the efforts by Texas and the other states. And so and so curious what you think about that long-term, both judicially and uh, I guess, legislatively in the Congress? That's a good question. I I still remain very positive and optimistic after Brackeen. Um, I mean, like, I think if they were going to do it, this, this was one of their best opportunities. I mean, they found there was no standing on the equal protection issue, but standing is a very malleable concept and the Supreme Court can sort of change standing doctrine at will whenever it wants as well and in equal protection areas in particular um we have seen the many argue that we've seen equal protection standing uh become a lot more expansive as equal protection has increasingly been a not a a doctrine of law that is featured in cases about protecting uh, minorities but more a doctrine that is featured in cases about creating, you know, facial neutral neutrality, which often means getting rid of policies that um, can be perceived as disadvantaged, any disadvantaging any group, most often nowadays disadvantaging people who are not minorities or who are white or male or what have you. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I, I think there was room I think they were not under existing precedent, but again, they can change things. I think there was room for them to get to equal protection here if they really wanted to. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say that the Article I theories were truly frivolous when there is a justice on the Supreme Court that um, adheres to them. Um, yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me that they would issue a decision that says, you know, we're two centuries in, 
we've we've let Congress do all this stuff. We're not undoing this today. And then five years from now, 10 years from now, they turn around and be like, oh, well, well, well now we're going to start really, really changing things. Like in general, since the end of the Warren court, Indian law has been a step, been a field where it's sort of five steps backward mm-hmm. and one step nowhere, just standing still. Mm-hmm. Like we preserve things the way they were before. Brackeen is kind of a, we just, we didn't really win anything. We just didn't lose anything type decision, um, which in this era is a huge victory, especially given what the stakes were. I, I think that we're going to continue to see the the marginal cases where there's room to argue the Supreme Court hasn't definitively laid down a rule. Those are going to be hard cases for tribes to win. Castro Huerta, two terms ago, another case I worked on, that was a loss in an area where, you know, Supreme Court dicta was completely with us, but the Supreme Court had never squarely held, it was a question about tribal jurisdiction, sorry, state jurisdiction over crimes committed by non-Indians against Indians, the Supreme Court had never squarely addressed whether state had jurisdiction over those crimes within Indian country. Um, Yeah, that was a loss. More losses like that will probably come, but that's what we're used to. But in my lifetime, that's always how it's been. Thanks. I don't want it to be that way, but. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to to turn uh, to the more practical again and, and, and ask Esther and Ryan if they have some some thoughts on resources on the ground here in Maine. Um, not necessarily legal resources, but just more broadly construed, you know, at, at the heart of this issue, at least with respect to ICWA is, you know, helping, helping children, right? And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on what more resources are needed, where they might be directed, what, um, you know, what we're doing now and what more could be done. Well, I think that Ryan had talked about substance use and, um, you know, the child welfare system is not, everybody says it's broken, but it's not really broken. I mean, it's working in, in, the, in a, the correctional, you know, it's in a legal system, but really we need to start supporting parents before the, it gets to child welfare intervention. And what happens is when children die, which we've had some children die in the, in the state, you know, people get all upset and they're upset with the department because they're not doing their job. So they put more pressure on the department. And then so the department starts investigating more cases mm. and then people get upset that, you know, the the state is in their business. And um, <clears throat> really what it takes is all of us to, to, to protect children, protect them. I mean, even that terminology, protect children from their parents, when we really should be supporting parents uh, up front mm before that it gets there. I mean, I have a friend, oops, I have a friend who has a very high needs child and um, <clears throat> she had to, she, you know, she was getting paid $13 an hour. She was paying $10 an hour in childcare for her child and she couldn't take care of him um, and she couldn't get any help. He starts acting up in school, DHS comes down on her, we uh, open a case, you know, and you get all this resources. So I just want to, you know, talk about the just the philosophy of this whole child welfare, child protection system. There's a group called Up End Movement that is really working to redo um, the child welfare system because it's inherently racist. Uh, Native children, Black children, Latino children have the highest disproportionate rates. They stay in care longer. They have the most disparate outcomes. Mm. And when you control for everything, it's racism. Sorry to get off track, but uh, so I, I just want everybody to to think about what they do in their own life to enhance the well-being of families in the state, because because this model we have, like it for I'll, I'll speak for the tribes, we have this uh, same model that the state has. We have a department of people who are professionally responsible to take care of children, and we've taken that. You know, if you think of our life as a circle, it's children are in the middle. That means everybody has a responsibility, not just the people who are paid to do it. So if you if we really want to solve this issue, ICWA, child welfare, all of it, we need to start thinking more um, and take more responsibility for children. Like if I really believe if we treat children well, we'll heal the world. I mean, that's it's like we got to stop, start somewhere. 
So when you talked about substance abuse, I want to talk just a couple seconds about how important the ICWA qualified expert witness is. And some of you might, might know what that is. But the ICWA QEW is so important because all of these years is children have been taken, you know, they had, some of them had court. I'm sure some of them were taken without court proceedings, but they had court proceedings and, and, you know, somebody took them away based on white middle-class parenting and cultural family standards. So the qualified expert witness is so important because they are tribal people that testify whether or not the continued custody of that child with their caregiver is going to lead to harm based on tribal standards. So it's such an important um, an important role. And the Equal Work Group has been, for the past maybe eight years, has been really trying to uh, recruit more tribal people to be qualified expert witnesses. And we have we have a roster of about maybe a dozen now. So um, that's a, a real important, any of you attorneys need to know about QEWs. <laughs> I think just the uh, resources across the board. I know when I work with parents, I think the hardest thing, um, and this is mainly in the in the tribal context, um, but I think it applies for the state as well. And that's just having the ability to access resources. So, right, if the department has a mental health concern, um, we're looking at six months to a year long wait list mm -hmm. um, to get someone in for counseling. And sometimes DHHS or the tribal workers will be able to have uh, the ability to help pull the strings and say, look, this is for a case that we have, it's open and you can get people moved in faster that way. Um, but it's really, really hard to work with a parent and say, look, part of your reunification plan is you need to do X, Y, and Z. And then we don't have the ability to get you into this treatment program. We don't have the ability to get you into this mental health counseling. Um, guess what? The the waiting list for you to not just have substandard housing still it's too long um, and your child can't live with you uh, in the sober housing that you live in. Um, so all across the board, I think those are really serious resource problems that we deal with. Um, and at the end of the day, um, parents suffer because of it. I think that um, children suffer because of it. And I think it makes it really, really hard too. on the other side. I, I do want to acknowledge, I think there's been some really serious stuff um, that's come out over the past year or so. I think there are really serious resource concerns too, just at DHHS. Um, being able to have um, sufficient resources and staffing to be able to do the full due diligence that's needed to make sure that that children are getting uh, the care they need. Um, and I think, too, just training is the number one. Um, misinformation is such a harmful thing for anyone that's involved in these situations. Um, and sometimes it's not uh, an immediate harm, right? But if a caseworker states to a parent that they believe XYZ is going to happen, um, they can be wrong, um, but that can really scare a parent. It can really scare a family placement. Um, it can be a really terrifying moment, especially if we're dealing uh, with a tribal family and someone in that family has the history, right? Maybe um, we get a lot here uh, where we are, right? People too that went to the day schools in Canada or went to boarding schools in Canada as well. Um, and so the thought that your child's going to be taken or your grandchild that's really hard. Um, and there's not a lot we can do to remedy that once that injury has been done with that misinformation. Um, and it hurts client expectations too, which is an attorney you always hate when client expectations get harmed. So um, I don't know how many clients I work with that have different misconceptions from things that they hear from, sometimes unfortunately it's also from the tribal child welfare workers, um, but you know that, that ICWA somehow applies in parental rights context, which it doesn't that ICWA may apply and mean something more for tribal parents in tribal court. ICWA doesn't apply when we're in tribal court. Um, that it's not, it's not true. Um, and it's really, really hard to work with people um, and get them down from very high expectations of case outcomes when they have a complete misread of the way that the law is. Um, and you're coming to them and saying, well, that would work really great for your case and would get you exactly the result you want. But unfortunately, I have to tell you and counsel you that that's not what it says, that's not my understanding of it. Um, and when that means, I don't think we'll be able to get your child back to you right away, that's a really incredibly hard thing to have to go back and forth with a parent on. So um, I think resources and training and information are all really important. On that note, we did have a question from online and I think it will be our last question, just given the context. Um, so uh, 
the question is for Judge Maynard in particular about the services that his court, uh, the Penobscot Nation uh, itself, are are providing to effectuate ICWA. And I might add to that question, it, since there are some attorneys watching and, and in the room for CLE credit, what resources might be out there for attorneys who maybe want to expand their practice or learn more about practicing in, in, in tribal court or practicing in these kind of areas? If there's places you could point them to, that would be, I think, a useful part of this answer. So at the Penobscot Nation, um, we run a healing to wellness court and it's a multidisciplinary team. The multidisciplinary team has, when you talk about services and the, the need for services, um, it is a team that is made up of uh, the director of social services, the director of housing, the director of education, two cultural advisors, two case managers, um, the director, a, a director of behavioral health, an individual from the MAT program, an individual from a prevention program. Um, and that team, oftentimes what we see is when an individual comes in under the, a, uh, a petition for a protection order and there's a family member that has a substance use issue, they're referred over to the Healing to Wellness Court and in fact, the state has actually started to refer tribal members of, we have a, a actually a Passamaquoddy who has been referred into the program saying, as part of your rehabilitation reunification plan, we want you to apply for and to attend the Penobscot Nation Healing the Wellness Plan. What then happens is the wellness court, which is a treatment court, takes the treatment plan, braids it together with the rehabilitation reunification plan and says, okay, how are we going to help these individuals get the services they need? At Penobscot, the, the nation really focused on, we want to help the individual get the services they need. One of the, the challenges that I think is out there is when you're telling someone who comes into contact with the system, and if, I, if someone had taken my child away and I was called into court and they said, these are the things you need to do before you ever see your child again, my answer would be, no, get away from me. Um, and and so attorneys play a huge part in this for us because one of the things that we count on for the Penobscot Nation Tribal Court is that our attorneys are actually members of our team and trying to get the reunification done. And we're very, very fortunate at Penobscot. We have a director of social services who says the idea is that we're going to reunify. And at Penobscot actually has, and I believe Pastor okay. McQuaddy does as well, that they do not favor termination. It is a last resort and uh, the, it places a heavy, heavy burden on the judge if it goes forward to termination. Um, talking about resources for individuals who have an interest in working in the, the tribal courts. Um, I think that the the I would actually leave that to, to others who might have some some ideas. I think as Esther talked about um, thinking about qualified expert witnesses, um, we always welcome individuals to come into the the tribal court. Um, it's a fairly easy process to get sworn into the wellness court to the tribal court, um, and we count on attorneys when they come in that what we're trying to do is solve problems. I, I tell everyone when I first got appointed, I thought I was appointed because I had done a lot of federal court work and I knew the rules of evidence and rules of procedure. And uh, the chief said, congratulations, we've appointed you. Um, uh, but we've seen how traditional courts work and that's not what we want. And I said, okay, what is it you want? And he said, we'd like a problem solving court. Okay, exactly what do you mean by a problem solving court? And he looked at me, cocked an eyebrow and said, figure out the problem and solve it. <laughs> um, and that's really the approach that I think you see the tribal courts take. Thanks a lot. Then I would say one thing. Um, to, to, if you want to work with Native people, you need to learn the history of what happened in the territory that you live in now. Um, and you can go to Wabanaki Reach and find all kinds of educational resources there. I'll just also say that the the against the termination or not doing the termination is often what we see instead is permanency guardianships. 
which positions parents much better if they are able to, you know, maybe they're not able to deal with the process while they're going through their child welfare case, but if they are able to at, at some point in their life and get back on track, um, you know, parents retain the right to come through and petition for a modification or a termination of that guardianship. Often those guardianships are with family members um, who know the person really well. Um, and so it, it, that can be a really helpful process. Join me in thanking our panel and our sponsors. Thank you for coming today. There, if, if you are looking for CLE credit, make sure that you signed in or checked in when you got here. Uh, there's still a lot of food outside, I think, unless the students all ate it. Uh, so please take more. Um, hope to see you uh, at a future Indian Law and History lecture. Thank you.